Welcome to Modern Aikidoist Podcast. The topic for today's podcast is being a good uke, and we've got a special guest. All right, so let's start our conversation with uh, Francisco de los Cobos, who's joining us for a bit of an interview and a chat today about, uh, firstly, being a, a good uke. We're going to get into that in a moment, but we're going to start out with uh, a topic that we discussed on the last podcast, which is uh, about what Aikido is and what is or is not Aikido. And Francisco had some interesting uh, thoughts on that. So welcome, Francisco. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Tristan. It's always a pleasure. Um, I'm, I'm really happy that we finally got to to share the mats uh, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, that was and, fantastic. Uh, you know, yeah, and 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 I really think that uh, you know your podcast and you know the other little projects uh, we have going on um, are just a follow up to that meeting, and uh, I think it's it's gonna grow from here. I hope this. Um, invites and inspires a lot of other Aikido cast and the martial artists so they can, you know, join in the in the good training. Definitely. It's a, it's exciting working with uh with you and Lenny. It was great to get together and you know, we do have some big things in the works and it's great to be su- part of such an active and vibrant group of people and there's more people that are coming out uh that are really uh, liking to be involved too. So um, but I wanted to start with you know, you, your view on Aikido because everybody has a different one, and, and you've got a kind of a unique view as a competitor, martial arts competitor as well. So maybe you could start with that that topic of what Aikido is to you. Yeah, definitely. I I do acknowledge and respect the tradition. That's where it came from, and you know we always should look at the past, uh, see where where things were born in why or for what purpose they were intended. Um, but then, like you mentioned in your previous podcast, um, you know, everything has to grow and evolve. So <clears throat> I, I have the, this idea, you know, I mean, it's a Japanese art, uh, it's a traditional art, and that should stay with it. But um, technically, I think, you know, it should evolve if, of course, you want to, make it the functional you want to make it you know work in the current um self-defense uh world in the end depending on where you live too you know uh Mm -hmm. but i think um technically speaking like we should um adapt and adopt techniques from other arts depending on what we want to work on um same thing that you were you know mentioning in, in your previous podcast uh, I mean, if you want to learn how to defend against a punch, then, you know, cross train with a boxer, uh, you know, mm-hmm. go to a gym, uh, you know, learn the basics uh, and, and then learn a good defense, you know, mm-hmm. and I don't know why this should not be called Aikido. It's, it's <laughs> in the end, it's martial arts. In the end, uh, like Bruce Lee said, we, we just have two arms and two legs and, and, and you know, fighting is going to be limited by the human um, body. So uh, why not, you know, call Aikido, you know, adopting other techniques to mm-hmm. our, you know, arsenal, to our tools. Um, I, I think it should. I think uh, we should go and cross train and, and uh, get the best of, of other arts. Um, I, I see this in uh, competitive combat sports. Um, Muay Thai has uh, adopted a great deal of um, uh, Western boxing for their, you know to be better strikers. Uh, same thing as uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu has adopted uh, you know a great deal of uh, sambo and uh, wrestling, mainly wrestling techniques. Mm-hmm. And you know they don't have a problem like oh you know this is not jiu-jitsu or this is not muay thai. Don't don't do this thing that it's not in our tradition. I mean they just mm-hmm. if it works they adopt it and they do it. And in the end, we're not, I believe, we're not defined by our style, but, you know, we are all martial artists. And if you want to be effective, you have to be well-rounded in this time. Yeah, I agree. In fact, you know, just as you tell that story, I I think back to uh, those people that would make uh, wagon wheels for horse and buggy, and they would see an automobile come along and they say, well, but that's not a horse and buggy, so I'm just going to keep making wagon wheels. Yeah. And soon they wake up and realize that the world has moved on and, and is using a better, easier way than than an old horse and buggy. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. In fact, that's uh, kind of bridging us into. I know you you do competition as well. So yeah, I I, I was active for uh, you know some years uh, mm-hmm. doing uh, boxing, uh, Muay Thai, and uh, MMA. Uh-huh. Um, and you know, I I just started like not not too long ago, and just a couple of years ago, also competing in uh, training and competing in uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> the 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 thing is that you know that that word like you mentioned too like competition um i don't know like it's it's uh i, I think it's a very personal uh experience mm-hmm. and when you say compete it doesn't necessarily has to be against somebody mm-hmm. um i mean the the way i always view that uh the way i kind of reconcile my you know, Aikido with, uh, you know, competing in a, in a combat sport mm-hmm. um, environment was, uh, you're always thinking about uh, masakatsu agatsu. It's mm-hmm. you're, you're, you want to be better than yourself. You're, you're sure. competing. If anything, you're competing against yourself. And it just happens that you go to a, to a setting where there's other martial artists that want to do the same, that want to get better at what they do and and you just meet with them and you each of us works on on the things that we need to get better and yeah you know there's there's a the aspect of winning and losing but it's it's just part of it i always looked at it from from that perspective of bettering yourself and i think that helped I, i i never saw any of my opponents with uh any disregard or or contempt i mean the other way around like most of the people that I fought, um, I'm, I ended up being really good friends and then, you know, training with them and, and mm-hmm. you know, there, there's no ill will. Um, right. Yeah, there's there's a lot of people that, you know, compete and feel they're you know, the ultimate warrior and, um, mm-hmm. you know, that egos, you know, sure. take over sometimes. But uh, most of the competitors that I that I met and trained with are super humble, are really nice people. Um, because they they have that exposure to reality and they're you know they're just you know nice guys, um, which a lot of you know martial arts that don't have that venue um, to prove yourself not to others but just to yourself to better yourself to work in yourself. Um, I've seen that that some of those arts, um, you know, especially traditional arts without competition, have like really really uh, blown egos and uh, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, I, and that I did something about competition. The uh, there was an article, an older article from Aikido Journal that just came up. It was an interview with Kenji Tamiki, and uh, he talked in there, uh, gave a little insight of something I'd never heard of before about Sakaku Takeda, who at the time, at his in his era, he viewed every human being as his enemy. Like if somebody came into a room, he would grab metal chopsticks and immediately like, who's that? Who's coming? And that was sort of the competitive mindset of the samurai at the time, because at any time you could be attacked. Um, And there are many accounts of if you were a warrior, especially in Japan, but if you were a warrior, everything was a threat. Every possible person you come in in contact with, you have to treat them as though they could immediately try to kill you. And, you know, they they said uh, Takeda was a pretty temperamental person, also to almost to the point of being paranoid because of that, or what we would view from a modern standpoint as being paranoid. And yeah. I think if, if, if Ueshiba had the attitude of, well, you don't need to be like that, then that explains his desire for having a more peaceful relations with people. But I, being a competitor for many years as well, I did almost three decades of full contact competition. I had the same experience that you did. I had people that were such great friends that I would drive across the country to get beat by them. Um, they were really good, amazing. They would share their knowledge. But when it came time to go, it was they were trying their best. I was trying my best. It still meant that we were friends, but we were both doing our best to, to win. And by doing so, we find out about ourselves, what need, needs work with our own martial art, uh, where the weaknesses are. And that's the fun part is finding those weaknesses and getting rid of them. Um, yeah, and you, and but you the idea that, better, that we were enemies or that we we hated each other that just was not even remotely part of the equation. We had a love, and I think this is when 
Oh, since they said, uh, always practice with and train with joy in your heart. I had such joy when I would get together with these people because we were doing what we were passionate about. We were trying to do our very, very best, but yet we were brothers. We were, we were kin in that. And not a lot of people understood that. They'd see us competing and be like, why do you guys do that? And it's like, you just don't understand. You don't understand how making yourself better and putting yourself through a crucible like this it's not that we dislike, even dislike each other, much less we're competing against each other, but there's no animosity or anything other than a real love. And, uh, and so and, I, you know, I think you can have both. I think there's a room for both. I think you do. I think, I think it's possible. And uh, one of the things is that you, you're talking about experience. Uh, in this case, you and I, mm -hmm. and I can think of a uh, you know, handful of other uh, Aikido practitioners that are friends of mine that also uh, went into competition one way or the other, and, mm -hmm. and they all found a positive experience from it. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that we have the last word on the subject matter, but um, when, when people that have not had that competitive experience um, mm -hmm. talk you know, negatively about competition, I, I think they're lacking a little bit of experience and perspective uh, yeah. so yeah like I, I i found that you know for most of the people that i know competitions has been a, a great and a positive yeah. experience so yeah. the people that that you know have a different mm -hmm. opinion i think they should first try um right and, and you know once they know about the subject then i think their their uh, their opinion their work can can have a little more weight sure yeah, yeah. And for those people that have not experienced at least the very good side of competition, I, I, I kind of feel sorry for them because they're missing a, a, a tremendous uh, life experience. And, you yeah. know, if they, if they grew up with a, with a brother or sister that they competed with, they've probably tasted a little bit of that. Um, yes. You know, they're still brothers, they're still sisters, they're siblings, but you still want to do better. And it doesn't, you know, at the end of the day, you, you, you hug and you you love each other, but there's still that point of, I want to win this foot race or, you know, uh, th that that's really all there is to it. And it did take me a little while to learn because I was an only child. So I never had that. I, I actually learned it in the sport, which I started when I was about 15 years old. Um, and it took a bit to get used to it because it can have a bit of a, of a bitter taste in your mouth when you go and you try your hardest and you you are defeated and, and you, you know, you feel that bit of this little sting of humiliation and things like that, but you learn how to put that aside. And because if you embrace that, you, you you'll, it'll just, just toxic. It'll be poison to you. Um, yeah. And, and I believe that, you know, when, when things are um, in, in, in good spirit, like you can find them in, in many realms, not only in this case in martial arts, but, I mean, you go to the business side of things and, mm -hmm. um, you know, competition has prompted, uh, you know, companies to, to do better, to create, yep. you know, more efficient ways, uh, mm -hmm. more, uh, you just, just in general, just, just get better at, at the product or service they're doing. It if does. there was not such competition, then, you know, they would, you know, just be stagnant and, and just die, you know, like we wouldn't mm -hmm. have, um, uh, you know, such good you know, services as, as we do today if, if it was not for competition. So it's, it's, it could be a healthy thing. It could be good, but yeah, like you mentioned, there's the ugly side, like, but that's not, you know, uh, exclusive to this. I mean, anything has its good and bad side, but, uh, you know, if we take something and focus on the bad things and, you know, right. it's, it's, uh, it's a never ending, you just complaining and, 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 you know, talking mm -hmm. about, you know, the worst and hating it. So, uh, I think we should take this in this case competition that we've seen other arts, um, you know, get get good get get really good benefits from, and and just you know put it on on our side of Aikido as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, this kind of bridges nicely into the the topic of being a good uke because it seems to me, at least from my experience anyway, that a lot of the Aikido realm goes way off to the opposite side, which is you never want to even feel as though you're competing. And so as uke, a lot of people believe that being a good uke is being completely compliant and soft and allowing 
just basically standing there and allowing Nage to do their technique. And in fact, if it, they view it as their job to make sure that Nage gets it right every time or, or never runs into that wall of having failed. Um, and so, I, but I think that's a common misconception uh, that, that being Uke is, is you just being a meat puppet. I, I don't think that's really the best way. So I've, I think I want to talk a little about that and about your experiences uh, for for being uke. What's what do you uh, what's important for you? Uh, important traits of a good uke. Um, from from the you know traditional side of uh, aikido training, just just the kata, um, you know, paired practice. Um, I I was fortunate enough to learn um, from my my you know first. Uh, teacher uh, Carlos Cordero in Mexico City, and he had uh, like like a special class for ukemi, uh, mm -hmm. which is you know not common in in many in many Aikido schools. Uh, and uh, what he said is that you know he he took most of those techniques from uh, Bruce Bookman Sensei. Mm -hmm. So we would just go over like just the way to receive techniques. Um, and, and that would be really good because then, uh, you know, partners could, you know, throw or pin, you know, harder every time and, uh, and we would be able to take it without getting injured. Like the, the main thing here was not getting injured. Um, so, you know, that, that was a, you know, really good thing. And uh, we went over things of like to give the correct resistance, the correct feedback, the correct attack. So Nagy can work with it. Uh, mm -hmm. Which this I I seen in a lot of Aikido schools they they try to you know give a um you know honest good attack uh you know on the on the basics of the art you know so so you can learn the the basic grabs and a couple of basic strikes <coughs> and you know you learn to follow uh, but it's very easy to to start being over compliant especially mm -hmm. you know when you practice with higher ranks. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's very mental too, so it's it's a good exercise to try and keep yourself like real uh, every time. Um, and one of the things that I I used to do when my my sensei mentioned that he liked that is that I I would just attack like with everything I had, like you know, like with reservations, like just you know not trying to anticipate what my sensei would do, but just just like go strong or like because I believed in him and I believed in Aikido. Mm -hmm. uh, and I believe in my own way of taking ukemi. So mm -hmm. it was fun. It was a good experience. He could show the technique that he, you know, intended to. People liked the, the, to see that. They got inspired. And it was just a good, uh, you know, environment, uh, good energy to practice, you know, like like sure. going, you know, almost all, like having, but it's still, it's still limited because you know which attack you're doing and you know which mm -hmm. technique you're going to receive most of mm -hmm. the time. Um, so up to that point, it was good. And, um, you know, I learned to have like, I would say a good okay, and follow good. Uh, but one time we were in a seminar, uh, a teacher from uh, Montreal, uh, Canada, came to, to, to teach uh, Sensei Massimo, mm -hmm. uh, Massimo de Villadorata. He, uh, was also a student of uh, uh, Saito Sensei, Morihiro Saito Sensei. Mm -hmm. um, and he's, he's a great teacher, uh, great human being, and, and has a lot of knowledge. So, you know, I, he took me as okay, and, you know, I was trying to my best to, to follow him, you know, give him good resistance and follow him. But, uh, you know, at one point I was like, just kind of like going a bit before he did. And he was just like, my God, this is great, but it's it's not... It's not good at the same time. You're this is you're you're too good of an okay. <laughs> I was thinking like, well, what is that a bad thing? Is that good? So you know, like I understood, like I, I need you need to give like enough resistance. Um, and and it's hard, you know. It's it, it there's a lot of connection that has to be done, both mm -hmm. mental and physical. Mm -hmm. But this made me think, okay, I need to change my ways and not just kind of like follow that easily, you know. Sure. Um. Because that doesn't help Nagi at all. That it's mm -hmm. not you're not doing any favors to him. It's actually, uh, you know, damaging, you know, their their skill level. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's just, you know, all the things that we gotta work on in the in the traditional kata way uh, mm -hmm. of pair practice. Now, uh, when you take it a little further to to the the place we wanna 
uh, get, which is um, modern self-defense, then that that's a whole new animal. In 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 this case, I believe Uke needs to be a good attacker, needs to be an effective striker, needs to be a good grappler, needs to to have the the at least the basics of of these um, techniques, uh, a good strategy as well. You know, like you're, there's gonna be you have to have a game plan. Um, so I think like. Uh, Uke needs to needs to have all these bases, you know, learn how to do a correct punch, either mm-hmm. uh, karate way or like boxing way or you know whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you if you want to develop a good defense against um, takedowns, Uke needs to be uh, like excellent uh, doing takedowns. Mm-hmm. Like needs to you know maybe take a couple of classes or um, I don't know like like have a constant. A training with a with a wrestler, with a high level wrestler, so we can emulate that and we can develop a good defense against that. Like, uh, we need to be well rounded if, if we want to take this to to reality, to the streets, to the self defense um, realm. We we need to have very um, effective ukes, very efficient ukes. Yeah, well rounded. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. You know. Um... Yeah, and one of the things that I've been I've added to my initial yellow belt test uh in the last year or so was actually I test my students on can they show throw good jabs, good crosses, uh yeah. good strikes and punches, can they do an effective uh, shove, you know, push to get somebody away from them? I mean, these are all viewed as attacks and and I've not heard of any other Aikido instructors that have added attacks as part of their test, but really it's an uke skill. It the more the more you understand that attack, the and the better you practice, the better attacks you practice against, the more comfortable you will be when you are faced with them. And so, to me, they go hand in hand. The uke skills. My instructors always said that being learning to be a good uke is about sixty percent of learning to be a good aikidoist, and it's even more so than just practicing being nage. And so, I think yeah. it's it's an often neglected set of skills. But it's beneficial to to making a good Aikidoist, not only to be able to execute good attacks, but also to do the Akemi, like you were talking about. Um, and that's something with new students I notice I have to, because they don't have the Akemi yet, they aren't comfortable getting to the ground yet, and I don't want anybody injured either. We have to really back down and kind of go slowly so that when they're thrown, they don't hit their head or, or you know, dislocate a rib or, you know, get knocked around too hard. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like it, it's, this is also, um, like two, uh, twofold, like beneficial, like for Nage, uh, you know, Nage will develop a correct defense and effective defense against, uh, uh, you know, realistic attack. Mm-hmm. And the second, like, uh, Uke is developing some, um, you know, martial skill that actually is, like immediately, you know, translatable to to self defense. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, doing a good uh, takedown, a good strike. Like, you're gonna need those in a real situation. So mm-hmm. you're training also that part that you know it's it's immediately useful as a mm-hmm. self defense tool. And I think that's that's very important as well. You know, okay, should not be like you said, just a dummy standing there. It, okay, should be like a competent uh, attacker. Right. You know what and I that, found that too is, is both okay and okay. in in studying the pugilism and the striking, the body mechanics are really similar, if not almost exactly the same as the ones that we use for throwing. Which I again, agree. you you go back, you know, the hip shifts, the drop steps, the the torso turns, and things like that, where you want the good alignment, you want the the movement coming out of the legs, all of that stuff is the same. And what I find with my students or rather students in this modern age, uh, since I opened my dojo at eight years ago or so now, that most people have no experience with throwing a punch. They see a fist flying out, so they think, I just extend my arm out. There's no body mechanic or movement behind it. And if that's what they come in as an uke, then they're, they don't even understand the body mechanics behind a strike, much less be able to, to learn it. So if they learn the body mechanics behind the strike, now they can practice body mechanics while they're being uke. They don't have to just think like, oh, I'm, I get to be the 
the, the practice dummy and I don't get to practice Aikido until we switch roles and I become Nage. Really what they're doing is practicing their body mechanics while they're being Uke. So that's correct. So it, it feathers right into the, the movements of using your whole body, moving from the legs and all those things which are beneficial to be to doing good Aikido techniques. Yeah, and, and I completely agree with you. Like, you know, studying like, you know, different martial arts, I found that the one that has the most relation to Aikido is uh, boxing. Mm. Um, you know, just, just generating power from the ground up, using your hips, you know, torquing, it all translates directly to, to the Aikido throws. Um, and, you know, one thing that, you know, my teacher used to, uh, you know, have us when we're drilling, um, and I think this is really important and, and this we can use when, when trying to be good ukes. What is a good uke? Somebody that pushes Nagi just far enough that that they need to up their game, mm-hmm. that they're not being lazy, but that they're not being overwhelmed. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, my teacher, George Perbowski, like he's, really knowledgeable and, and, and very technical. Mm-hmm. Um, he would, you know, have us do boxing drills or Muay Thai drills and, and, you know, try to have us had like a 70-30 ratio, which means, mm-hmm. you know, while you're doing the drills, if you're succeeding, you know, 70% of the time and 20 you're failing and you need to adjust, that, that's a good pressure. That's being mm-hmm. a good okay. Mm-hmm. Um, you you can see it clearly if you are 100% succeeding every single time, that means, you know, is not giving you enough. Mm-hmm. And if you're never succeeding, like that means Uke is just overwhelming you and it's just, you need to tone it down a little bit. So mm-hmm. uh, I think when we pressure our partners just here and there, um, having that 80, 20 or, or 70, 30% ratio of success, mm-hmm. I think that's a great, measurement uh you know to 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 have between you know nagi and uke resistance um, definitely in fact uh i read an i read an article about it two years ago that talked about even animals like uh like let's say a wolf pup is wrestling around with their with their mom or dad even the adult doesn't just overwhelm the pup because he, they could or mice will do the same thing if they're wrestling with a with a baby mouse they want to teach them about how to wrestle around but even though they've got the size advantage they won't do it other because if they do it what happens is that the pup the the wolf pup for example will just quit he won't even they won't practice anymore because they're just getting outright beat so even the adult knows you kind of play around and you you let the young one win enough you know about 80 70 80 percent of the time so that they want to keep playing and uh yes that's where if you, yeah and and even animals know this i mean what's the brain size of a mouse it's you know the size of a, a peanut if, if even and so even they understand if you want it to bring out more practice in the young in the young ones in the, in the students you have to let them play let them win you know get dominant positions i mean and you see a, a wolf pups play i mean how often does an adult roll over and let a pup get on top of them which is the dominant position it happens all the time and yeah. so I, I think that that, and that, that is how they teach their young, you know, they can't speak or, or anything like that, but that's how they teach them how to, how to fight, how to wrestle. And then of course, how to hunt uh, for predators, uh, things like that. So I think humans have the same kind of a thing. And, and it's one thing to, to go in and try to dominate, you know, if you're an experienced Uke and you're dealing with a, a an inexperienced Nage, it's easy to, to, you know, ha ha, I'm foiling your, your technique every time, but they'll just get frustrated and quit. Likewise, if you go soft and mushy and just let everything succeed all the time, they'll never really learn where the limits are. And that's, and that's, that's, that's dangerous crucial. because they, they develop, uh, they develop, they could develop, um, you know, false sense of confidence. Oh, my technique works all the time. You know, oh, this is exactly. what I do. And then when they face reality, they might be disappointed. Uh, which yep. is doing a, a disservice to to the art. And I and I think um, that's where you get your the the crisis of faith when somebody uh, tr- trains for years against a really compliant set of ukes and then runs into resistance and they just go they throw their hands up and go what what was what did I learn I what I learned was just garbage it, it's not useful I don't have any actual skill yeah. and then they condemn the art or they you know they quit and go off and try to find something else and. And uh, I, I think it foregoes the pain in the short term 
of learning, but it, it amasses up and it will at one day it unleash itself. And when that happens, it's like heartbreak of the pe- the practitioners that think they, like you said, the false confidence. They thought they had something right. useful and it's not. And and that right. so so uke in that sense is not doing nage any favors. Um, yeah, yeah. They need to they need to to just give enough pressure. Too much it breaks. Too little doesn't develop. So I think this is this is one uh, skill. It's a skill. It's it's hard to you know work in. And every partner is different. So right. you know you're not gonna give the the same um, seventy thirty to you know a young uh, you know guy that than, than to an older one or uh, somebody that is just you know physically stronger than somebody mm-hmm. that is more agile. Like it's 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 beautiful. You have to work different with every single person, and I, I think that makes you grow as well. Yeah. Um, so I, I think like people should start to you know look a little bit more into this. It's it's just basic. It's just who can I get a relationship mm-hmm. in in the pressure that you're giving them. Sure. We're obviously adapting uh, what we talked about in the beginning, like realistic attacks. What happens uh, you know the most in in the area where you live. Um, mm-hmm. You know I don't want to get too deep into this, but it's it's different you know from from fighting here in the U.S. Uh, right. where, you know, it's more a uh, you know a fist fight than in the UK where most things are gonna start with a headbutt, mm-hmm. uh, and, and you need a different approach. You need a different uh, you know game plan. But right. you know you ad- you see where you are living in, in, and you adapt your game for for that, mm-hmm. and you have your UK work with you on on those you know realistic attacks. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think little by little going through the Q ranks. You know, by the time you're, you know, Bramble, you know, second, first, you, you have a, a, a very well, um, a, ve- a very good and effective UK in the ways of attacking that, you know, mm-hmm. serves him well also to, to defend himself. Sure. Um, so, yeah, and, and, and like you mentioned, you know, it doesn't have to take like years. I mean, by the time mm-hmm. we get there, we're going to have like really, really good attackers. Mm-hmm. Uh, which means we're going to have really good defenders as well, really good uh, nagas. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, like just working on, on basic stuff early on is going to give the student, uh, you know, realistic skills. Mm-hmm. And, and that doesn't need to, to leave behind, you know, the traditional um, blueprints of the art of Aikido. Like you can still work on those and, and mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's just, you know, a little more curriculum to work on and it's, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, I was lucky enough when I was coming up through the Q ranks that uh, there was a guy who who started about a year after me, uh, although he didn't go to quite as many classes as I did. I was kind of the, the dojo rat. I was there all the time. But he he and I grew to be good friends primarily because we were both kind of focused on the same thing. I brought some of my competitive uh, background in and wanting to always hone my technique down. And so as we got to know each other more, I would, when we would practice together, we'd kind of say, okay, go a little harder, go a little faster. I want you to try to break my technique. I want you to be more slippery or more, you know, uh, try to counter. And, and so we would kind of ratchet up the, the scale as he and I would work together. And I realized that not all the students that were in the class would like to do the same thing. But since I got to know him, when we partnered up, we were able to communicate with each other and say, all right. And he liked the same thing I did. So he'd say, okay, you know, give me a little, try to trick me, do a feint or, you know, try to, uh, try to uh, really challenge me, try to break my technique basically. And it was uh, probably one of my most cherished memories of, of training through that time was having my friend Mark there that he and I could push each other and really try to go just beyond, you know, memorizing the kata or the, you know, the movement we would really try to try to get past each other or, or, you know, make the technique fail uh, because that's where we found out where are the limits? What can it, what can a technique do? What can it not do? And you can see when it starts to break down and, and that's when you need to shift to something else or abandon it or, you know, make adjustments rather than force your way through that technique. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's, um, it's a training that should be available for everybody, but mm-hmm. Not everybody is gonna choose to go that way. Right, some exactly. People are gonna come to the dojo with a different mindset and wanting mm-hmm. the, you know, just to study and cultivate the traditional side and uh, yep. 
the cultural side and, and you know all the other great benefits that I get as well for both. I mean, th- there should be the 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 martial side of it also mm-hmm. available for the people that are in for for that. You know, like I I, I think that um, it it's a shame when when uh, people that want this part of Aikido and they don't find it in their dojo, they have to switch arts. Right. Because it's not available for them. I think Aikido has that potential to to offer that to you know everybody uh, mm-hmm. whoever chooses to and also it's a very important thing uh, for the instructors mainly and then for the student himself or herself to to know what what they want to get out of their training mm-hmm. if they're in for the cultural um, aspect then, then they should focus on that and, and not mm-hmm. you know fool themselves into thinking oh this works I can defend myself with this sure or, or be out there and try to represent the art, uh, mm-hmm. you know, in, in the real, in the self-defense world, if they're not studying that side of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that will also lower the uh, the number of people disappointed with the art because they're, I think they're disappointed because they're, they're expecting something they're not working for. Sure. Yeah, but, one of the but, things I, I noticed in my travels is, is the atmosphere in some dojos. Now, I, the, the one in the, the that uh, was in the dojo I came up in was fairly casual and we were encouraged to help each other as ukes and nages, but I've gone to some dojos which are very solemn and, and somber and, and where students are pretty much, you don't speak unless you're the instructor on the floor. So if you're working with a, with a nage that's struggling now in my dojo, my instructor always said, if you if you're working with somebody and they're struggling and they they're having a hard time, you help them, tell them what they should be doing, guide them through it. But in some places, it's not like that. You're not only the only instructor is supposed to help students. And what I saw was often they wouldn't because there's only one instructor and there might be you know 20 students. And uh, so to me, I I always took it the way that my instructor showed, which was, you know, yeah, you might only be a, a blue belt or a purple belt or something. But if you know a way that you can help your, your nage, then help them. Tell, tell them what they should be doing or give them some advice. And it doesn't matter if you're, if you're wrong, because if you let them struggle in silence and you don't help them, I, they, not that nage, that inexperienced nage will see that and they'll be like, right, well, are you here to help me or, or am I just going to struggle by myself? And so have you noticed the same thing in traveling to other, visiting other dojos or have you ever, ever run across anything like that? I see I've I've had a good fortune to like you know end up in in dojos when I travel or or uh, you know go to seminars where everybody's like pretty friendly and in mm-hmm. the atmosphere is like like you're all dojo like just try to help uh mm-hmm. you know the the partner if he's not getting the technique you know with good explanation uh, mm-hmm. so yeah I, I but I know that there are those other kind of dojos where, you know, it's like, you know, very ritualistic and, and almost like a sect or a cult, you mm-hmm. know, and, and, and that, you know, doesn't produce good students. And yeah. uh, and it's a shame too, because, you know, like some, some like really earnest student might end up in that kind of dojo and, you know, mm-hmm. he's not right. going to find what, what they, they wanted to begin with. Yeah. And to be fair, I haven't, I've only experienced that once or twice. It's not been very common, uh, but it always makes me wonder like, wow, wow. You know, there's, they could be doing, having such a better atmosphere and camaraderie in there because when you train, you learn far more from your training partner than you do from the instructor who's leading the class. I mean, they'll, they'll show you, but you're really getting the tactile feel from your, from your partner. That's where the magic really happens. Um, yeah. And the uh, I actually wanted to also cover this a little bit too, which is you know for those people, especially newer people uh, to Aikido, and I I found this when I started traveling to other seminars that weren't in my dojo or visiting other dojos. Uh, when I was an intermediate student is when I started doing this, but what I would do, and I I felt that this was being a good uke, and that is if I was partnered with somebody that was more experienced, I would definitely let them set the tone for how to do technique like because you'd figure out all right is this person going to be kind of you know work real slow and work on technical precision are they going to be kind of tight are they you know how how do they actually do do it 
And uh, we had a visitor who kind of showed me how to do this before I, it's co- it was just coincidence, but he came to our dojo and he was, uh, I think, a Sandan at the time. And I was just like, a, I think, purple belt or blue belt or something. And, and but he came from a pretty, uh, I'd say a little bit more strict of an organization. And so, and a very respectful guy. And he and I became the best of friends. But when he came to our class, he'd visit to our city and he would come in and he'd train with us, but he would never say a word. And, uh, you know, he'd kind of go along with what he saw the class was going. But when I partnered up with him, he'd start to give a little bit tighter technique. It was, it was solid. And, you know, I would smile because I would, I love, I'm like, that's, he's amazing. Like his Aikido is really, really good. And there was, once he gets a hold of you, there's no getting out. I mean, it was, it was very tight. And so he, I would smile and then I'd see him notice. And then he would start to, without saying a word, he would show some tighter pins, some, you know, variations and and nuances to technique that I wasn't even, didn't even notice, but he did it. He exaggerated in such a way that I could tell what he was doing. And, uh, and it was fantastic. I, I love that. And then, you know, of course, when it became my turn to Nage, then I would try to do what he did. And so I would emulate, you know, how he was doing it. And uh, it was just he guided me through really honing my technique. And I loved working with more advanced duques like that. Uh, because, when, when, because when they, they do, do that, when they do that, you learn new things. And so they have to up their game again. Right. You have to get better because you already know, uh, you know, those little nuances and, and things that uh, you didn't know before. So now they have to come up with better things, better technique, better connection, uh, you know, better kusushi. Uh, mm-hmm. But that's that's the way both Uke and Nage grow when when you teach your partner mm-hmm. like that, or you know, when you put some pressure in your um, in your Nage like that, being being yeah. a good Uke. So that's that's great. And I, and I also wanted to share a, a story of when that same approach blew up in my face. <laughs> um, I was visiting a dojo, and uh, I think I was second purple or, or brown belt level at that time. So I had, I had more experience. And uh, uh, my girlfriend at the time and I were traveling uh, to her family home, and so I, I took my gi and my hakama with me. And I think I had hakama, so I would have been brown belt level at that point. And so I visited this dojo and they're all really nice. And, and we had a, about, you know, 10 or 12 people in the class and there was, I don't know, about four or five black belts. And so I used the exact same formula. I'm like, okay, I'm the visiting Uke, you know, visiting student. I'm going to just do what they're all doing. And um, so I got partnered up with this black belt and I'm like, okay. I'm, I, I And I loved being Uke first, you know, and that was kind of the tradition in our dojo is that the Kohai would be uh, Uke first. And then, you know, so I, I did that and I wanted to see how uh, Nage was doing technique. And in this case, we were doing Shiho Nage. And, and uh, let them set the pace and the strength. Yeah, of exactly. The well, yeah, they that's can good. tell me how much zing they want to put on it or, or how to do it. And I'll pretty much just do it the way they do it. And and this, this Shodan, I think he was Shodan, but Black Belt, definitely. He put a, a Shiho Nage on me that was like I was shown how to do it. One variation, I should say. And that was rather than having your body stay upright, so you kind of, you tip Uke just a little bit, you tip them a lot. As you start to turn under their arm, you kind of stick your butt out and you stretch their arm out sideways over over your head. And I mean, it puts a fair amount of, of tightness on through the through the shoulder joint. I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. He shows it one of the ways I was shown to do it. And so he did through his reps, and I'm like, ah, that's that's neat. I mean, you know, the girl, uh, not many people like to do it that way. So I did it to him, and he stopped, and he just he read me the riot act. Like, how dare you put put this on this tight? Like, you know, and I'm just like, you know what? I apologize. I'm sorry. I didn't, you know, I did. I didn't try to argue it out. There's no nothing good to to try to make your case there of saying, well, I'm sorry, sensei, but I was just trying to do it the way you did. I just said, you know what? I apologize. I didn't, you know, I'll go lighter. You know, I didn't, didn't mean to offend you or anything like that. And, and, uh, but, but afterwards I kind of thought, you know, what, 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 what went on there? <laughs> did that make really make sense? And like, okay. I mean, that's old. So they teach you what, when you're three or four years old, don't dish it out. If you can't take it, you know, yeah. be, be ready to, to have it go the way that you, you initiate yeah, things. Yeah, exactly. That's that's uh, that's exactly what I like to also let let them start and set the pace and the 
the yeah. rhythm, you know, and then mm-hmm. and then you either rob it from there or but yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. there's there's a lot of uh a lot of uh, people that you know one one I just like you know instead of training practice or growing together you want to demonstrate their better technique and, right you know not and that kind of all the time and you know yeah, yeah. see like when 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 you don't have a not a you know per se competition but when you don't have that that ground to prove to to train realistically to push yourself then you end up with that kind of people Right, right. You know, and that, that actually you know, bridges like, to something I wanted to cover, which is what about a bad nage? Because uke, what I've experienced is that when you're uke, you have to have a certain level of trust that nage is not going to hurt you. That that you're giving them, and, and I heard this described that uke is is giving your body. You're you're giving an honest attack, even though you know it's going to be countered, and you, you still want to extend. You want to give them that energy like a real attack would have but of course being it that's aikido that energy is going to be turned back around against you it's the that we call it the energy in energy out principle the harder you attack the harder you get thrown etc um but what about the idea that when you throw an attack and you have an, a nage who decides he wants to put so much crank on you that you now the next time you don't want to extend your energy because you're concerned about getting hurt, um, I'm sure you've run into you had had to run into an experience like that at some point. Um, yeah, like when 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 you find that kind of people, it's just like it's really in my experience, I I uh, I have always been able to you know thanks to a good ukemi, mm-hmm. uh, not get hurt. But you know, you just kind of like either tone it down or or completely disengage with the partner and just mm-hmm. finish your you know session with him and, and bow out and, and go away i mean yeah pretty uh, much yeah like there there's nothing to be gained from training with somebody like that mm-hmm. like that's right completely like ego driven that, that has a mm-hmm. bad intention i mean he knows what technique you're gonna attack with and and then of course they can crank it and be all strong and you know yep. looking hard i mean that that has no martial value at all right. um so yeah that kind of people like I, you know if they're doing that there's not even that point to talk to them and, and you know make them you know put some sense into them either by force or by talking or anything you just like you know let them be the the bad thing is that you know if you're a good okay you might save yourself but there's gonna be another person that comes and they're gonna get injured maybe so oh yeah i don't know that's that's like uh that's like concern you know there, there's mm-hmm. very few of these people but mm-hmm. there are out there but you know what it's not exclusive to Aikido. It no, no. happens everywhere. Like you, yep. you can see it in, in Jiu-Jitsu, and boxing, and MMA. Like you yep. know, you have the the partner that you know. I've seen it a lot. You know, in boxing, like you have the partner that you know you you're doing drills, but he wants to win the drill mm-hmm. to outscore you or outmuscle you in a drill where you know what's coming. Mm-hmm. So you know these people, you know, just don't have the the mindset to to have a you know good training experience and, mm-hmm. and and again normally these people are the ones that just go to the gym or dojo to train but never have a, a competitive experience or a fighting experience so right. you know the, the, you know for them they they define themselves and they they define their ego by oh i won today at the gym mm-hmm. you know like that yeah. that's just not worth training with yeah, fortunately, I've run into very, very few people of those in Aikido, a few, a bit more in some of the other arts. But uh, generally, that sort of behavior is discouraged. And there, fortunately, are very few rather sadistic people or, you know, folks that want to just learn to hurt hurt others, uh, which is kind of nice. Um, you know, Aikido is, there's so much joint pressure and crank and, of course, throws that, and I've always said the earth hits harder than anything else. So throwing somebody to the ground or, or even allowing them to just fall from a high height is is you know pretty rough and you know at least until you get your okemi down and even then it's not necessarily a picnic. Um, yeah. But and, and you know I've, I've one of the uh, I've got a judo instructor at my school that he's been doing judo since like the early 70s and he's amazing and he can throw not only throw smooth but he could do the throw part hard and then at the end when you're coming down he just lifts you up a little bit and just sets you gently down 
And it, he's just a perfect example of what good control of a throw all the way from the beginning to the end can be, even though he, he's got that variable. And I think Aikido's got this, is you can make your throw really powerful, but you can adjust it so that the impact at the end is pretty benign. Uh, it, it doesn't need to be, you know, slam somebody hard um, or rely on their ukemi or even challenge their ukemi uh, because then, you know, you have that control to make sure that you can keep training throughout your your session or even, you know, through the week so your, you know, ukes aren't getting banged up. Yeah. And, you know, this, this um, you know, kind of reminds me of, uh, you know, top-level athletes, um, mm-hmm. you know, boxers, MMA guys. Uh, they don't train and spar hard every time. They don't try to hurt each other because their livelihood depends on on being healthy and, and getting, you know, to the fight uh, day complete. Uh, so they're not gonna spend or waste more than spend. They're not gonna waste their energy or health in mm-hmm. training sessions. They they know that. And I mean, if, you know, top elite level athletes do that. Like, you know, why should that be different for us. Yes, right. there is time for hard sparring, like you know, maybe once or twice, and mm-hmm. uh, but but you know, it's it's uh, the training, the getting the technique, the conditioning. It's it's more important. Yeah, so absolutely. That's, that's what we should focus on too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I wanted to share one uh, one what I call a bad uke story, and it kind of makes me laugh. But uh, I had an, an old instructor, and he was infamous for this, so much so that all of the the senior students knew that he would do this. And when usually at a seminar or something, when he would be uke, the first time you went to do a technique, he would foil it every single time. And of course, then he would use that as the opportunity to say, well, here's where you're doing it wrong. Here's how to fix it. And then the next time you would do it and you could do it exactly the same way you did it the first time. And then he would be a good uke for you. And it was really funny because at one seminar, I'd finally caught caught wind of this or, or, or figured out how, you know, that he was doing it. And by this time, I think I was either EQ or, or Shodan. And I got to partner with him, and I did the exact same thing that he would always do to me. Because not, now you know technique. You know what, what your attack is. You know what his response is going to be. You can easily make a just a tiny adjustment and make sure that that technique doesn't work. And so I did it. And sure enough, and he was very talented. Aikido is very technically capable. And sure enough, his technique failed. And I, I just kind of okay. I, I then realized what it was like on that other side, just to see. Okay, I, I now understand what what's going on here. And it, I just laughed because it, it's, it just seems so ego driven. Like this was such a an instructor bad habit. Like I must instruct you, so I'm gonna make sure that your technique fails so that I can give you my instruction. Yeah. You know, and I was like, you just kind of shake your head. And, and as I, you know, talk to my other, other seniors about it, they kind of just all smile and like, yeah, he does that. <laughs> you know, it was, I, it was I, an accepted you, kind of thing. You know, that kind of thing I have found <laughs> out like very often, not with mm-hmm. instructors, but just with uh, senior students, mm-hmm. advanced students, mm-hmm. they do that a lot. And yep. um, you know, it's, uh, I think it's a um, you know trap that you can easily fall. Yeah. Um, and, and it's funny because they they stop your technique, they know what's coming, so they can obviously stop it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they they try to teach you or lecture you about something. Mm-hmm. And so you know what I do? It's it's just so funny. Um, you know, when when I find these kind of people, like like you just do exactly the way they said, but without any effort without any body mechanics, without any correct alignment, and they fall. And they're like, yeah, 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 that was it. <laughs> and and you, yep. inside, you feel like I didn't do anything. Like I just yep. made you think that I did it the way you said, mm-hmm. and you fell for it, literally right. like falling for their technique. So mm-hmm. it's it's just hilarious like to, to think that that's, you know, it's, you know what's going on in your mind that mm-hmm. – that they, uh, you know, can fall for their own trick. It's it's just so weird. <laughs> it is very weird. And, I mean, being in, in competition, when you're in a tournament, you know, you don't have any of that opponent that's going to give it to you or opponent. I mean, he he's going to do his best all the time. Anything you get, you got to earn it. And so yeah. that's where the – I just laughed when I would see that happen 
because it was so alien to what I was used to in terms of whether it was, you know, uh, more competitive type sparring, which we tried to emulate more like a high pressure tournament, or when you actually go into a tournament and you're, everything you do matters. And if you slip up or you screw up, that could be the end of your, your tournament day. And so, you know, all of that's with all that stuff being removed. Now you have opening for, you know, things like that, which is uh, kind of, kind of funny. I know. So I, I think this is this is a point where we can like really connect the, the two topics uh, we're touching today, which is being good okay and uh, you know like how some people you know shut down competition. Mm-hmm. I definitely agree with with you and a lot of other Aikido is that uh, you know competition in the Aikido world it's it's kind of hard because it's it's still a bolo it's still. Mm-hmm a self-defense, um, you know, purpose for, for the art. Mm-hmm. It's not an, an evenly matched, uh, you know, art where we can, where we can spar evenly or, or compete mm-hmm. evenly. Like the roles of Uke and Agi are well-defined. So mm-hmm. competition is a little hard, but right. having a good Uke, uh, mm-hmm. capable Uke with, with correct attacking power technique, Mm-hmm. Um, strategy uh, definitely can can help um, you know Nagi develop a solid solid foundation a solid uh, self defense sure. technique and strategy as well. Uh, I think this is this is what we should be working on more than you know competition like this, mm-hmm. you know competition again it should be masakatsuaga it should be against definitely. ourselves mm-hmm. if anything. Definitely. Um, so within our class, within you know the dojo, within the Aikido dojo, I think this is where we can, um, you know, gain some new perspective and 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 skill set uh, mm-hmm. in having a good uke. Yes. You know, uke meaning all that we talked about, mm-hmm. and in um, again to develop that skill, um, I would encourage people to go and cross train. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, especially if they have the time or the money or the willingness to do it. Like you sometimes don't need the money. You can go and talk to you know, an instructor and maybe help them with classes or, or, you know, help them with space. If you have a dojo, available. like do some kind of, you know, arrangement. Like if you don't have the money to, to go and train with, with other people in other arts or invite people to your dojo and, you know, mm-hmm. train with them, you know, every now and then. Uh, I, I really, really recommend, you know, especially uh, traditional uh, arts, in this case Aikido, to go and, uh, you know, take a boxing class, uh, make mm-hmm. friends, expose yourself, uh, open your mind and learn things if you want to make it work for self-defense. Again, if you're not interested in that, it's, it's no problem. But for the people that really want to have a, an applicable uh, functional technique, uh, I think this is great. Unfortunately, or fortunately, we need this now because you know the the the, the Aikido training it's it's uh, still very um, new, very uh, you know still evolving in this in this realm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I hope you know later we can have um, this type of experience without leaving the dojo, which is the thing with what we need, and especially for instructors, if you're claiming to teach self-defense. Mm-hmm. Um, in your Aikido, you should definitely be, you know, savvy and, and, and good in your striking, in your grappling, um, and, and teach that to the students, you know, early on. But as of now, I think there's very few people that have experience. Mm-hmm. So I think the the best option right now is to to do the cross training. And you know, it's it's not like, um, you know, some people that we've seen on YouTube and Facebook like challenging. How can you challenge if you don't even know or you haven't studied the other people's technique? I mean, it's just, <laughs> you know, ridiculous to me when people are, oh, I'm going to go to so-and-so and then challenge. Like, you don't know what they do. Like, right. it, you might be good, but they might be better. And, and I mean, it, it just doesn't make sense. So yeah. it's not about challenging people. It's about growing, growing with them, making new friends. Uh, learning, maybe you have something to teach them too, maybe not, maybe you're just there to learn. In, uh, but I, I found out that when you go to another gym with the right attitude, you gain so much, not only technically, but also personally. And you can 
meet great people and make new friends and Definitely. have a lot of fun. Yeah. So, in fact, uh, one of the upcoming podcast episodes is going to be on uh, different ideas for how to cross train and, and nice. sol- kind of solve that problem. So maybe we'll we'll do another interview and I put more of those notes together and, and do it that way. Um, yeah, sounds good. The last thing I want to leave with is actually an example from the cross training and even being a good UK part. And that is uh, for Joe. And you met Joe when we were down at Lenny's a couple of weeks, a yeah. month ago or so. When we got uh, him prepared for his showdown test, which he just did uh, last fall, I brought in my wrestler friend who's been working with me building a wrestling uh, grappling program with uh, with my Aikido. Uh, I brought uh, my friend Reed in to, to train with Joe, and, and first thing he said was, okay, Joe, what are we here to do? And he said, well, we're, I want to prep for my, my showdown test, and there's going to be some grappling and takedowns on it. So Reed just said, well, guess what? I'm going to make this class tougher than your, your showdown test. So by the time your showdown test comes, it'll be like a walk in the park. And <laughs> I, you'd think when he said that, that it was going to turn into like a Conan pit where, you know, Reed was just going to attack him. And he's, no, nope, it was exactly the way we would do it in Aikido class where, you know, you start out, you learn a technique and it just gradually gets more intense. And at the end, it's like, okay, now we're going to, now we're going to go. And I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to pin you down. I'm going to try to, you know, get you all wrapped up like a pretzel. And your job is to survive and get back to your feet because that's the basis of the of the the grappling uh, that I've brought yeah. into Aikido. And sure enough, by the time the test rolled around, Joe did great. He breezed through it because it was Reed being a good uke, giving Joe what he needed to learn to increase his skills and get more capable and competent. And it worked brilliantly. That's amazing. That's that's uh, a very good example of how being a guru can make uh, Nagi grow. Yep, absolutely. So, well, good. We'll wrap it up here. And um, well, thank you very much for the the chat, Francisco. I always love chatting. Thank with you. you. Thanks for having me, Tristan. And yeah, let's let's uh, let's keep working and uh, hope to see you on the mat again soon. The chat, Francisco. I always love chatting. With thank you. you. Thanks for having me, Tristan. And yeah, let's let's uh, let's keep working and uh, hope to see you on the mat again soon. The chat, Francisco. I always love chatting. Thank with you. you. Thanks for having me, Tristan. And yeah, let's let's uh, let's keep working and uh, hope to see you on the mat again soon. The chat, Francisco. I always love chatting. Thank with you. you. Thanks for having me, Tristan. And yeah, let's let's uh, let's keep working and uh, hope to see you on the mat again soon. The chat, Francisco. I always love chatting. Thank with you. you. Thanks for having me, Tristan. And yeah, let's let's uh, let's keep working and uh, hope to see you on the mat again soon. The chat, Francisco. I always love chatting. Thank with you. you. Thanks for having me, Tristan. And yeah, let's let's uh, let's keep working and uh, hope to see you on the mat again soon. The chat, Francisco. I always love chatting. Thank with you. you. Thanks for having me, Tristan. And yeah, let's let's uh, let's keep working and uh, hope to see you on the mat again soon. The chat, Francisco. I always love chatting. Thank with you. you. Thanks for having me, Tristan. And yeah, let's let's uh, let's keep working and uh, hope to see you on the mat again soon. The chat, Francisco. I always love chatting. Thank with you. you. Thanks for having me, Tristan. And yeah, let's let's uh, let's keep working and uh, hope to see you on the mat again soon. The chat, Francisco. I always love chatting. Thank with you. you. Thanks for having me, Tristan. And yeah, let's let's uh, let's keep working and uh, hope to see you on the mat again soon. The chat, Francisco. I always love chatting. Thank with you. you. Thanks for having me, Tristan. And yeah, let's let's uh, let's keep working and uh, hope to see you on the mat again soon. The chat, Francisco. I always love chatting. Thank with you. you. Thanks for having me, Tristan. And yeah, let's let's uh, let's keep working and uh, hope to see you on the mat again soon. The chat, Francisco. I always love chatting. Thank with you. you. Thanks for having me, Tristan. And yeah, let's let's uh, let's keep working and uh, hope to see you on the mat again soon. The chat, Francisco. I always love chatting. Thank with you. you. Thanks for having me, Tristan. And yeah, let's let's uh, let's keep working and uh, hope to see you on the mat again soon. The chat, Francisco. I always love chatting. With Thank you. you. Thanks for having me, Tristan. And yeah, let's let's uh, let's keep working and uh, hope to see you on the mat again soon. The chat, Francisco. I always love chatting. With Thank you. you. Thanks for having me, Tristan. And yeah, let's let's uh, let's keep working and uh, hope to see you on the mat again soon. The chat, Francisco. I always love chatting. With Thank you. you. Thanks for having me, Tristan. And yeah, let's let's uh, let's keep working and uh, hope to see you on the mat again soon. The chat, Francisco. I always love chatting. Thank with you. you. Thanks for having me, Tristan. And yeah, let's let's uh, let's keep working and uh, hope to see you on the mat again soon. The chat, Francisco. I always love chatting. Thank with you. you. Thanks for having me, Tristan. And yeah, let's let's uh, let's keep working and uh, hope to see you on the mat again soon. The chat, Francisco. I always love chatting. Thank with you. you. Thanks for having me, Tristan. And yeah, let's let's uh, let's keep working and uh, hope to see you on the mat again soon. 
the chat, Francisco. I always love chatting. Thank with you. you. Thanks for having me, Tristan. And yeah, let's let's uh, let's keep working and uh, hope to see you on the mat again soon. The chat, Francisco. I always love chatting. Thank with you. you. Thanks for having me, Tristan. And yeah, let's let's uh, let's keep working and uh, hope to see you on the mat again soon. The chat, Francisco. I always love chatting. Thank with you. you. Thanks for having me, Tristan. And yeah, let's let's uh, let's keep working and uh, hope to see you on the mat again soon. The chat, Francisco. I always love chatting. Thank with you. you. Thanks for having me, Tristan. And yeah, let's let's uh, let's keep working and uh, hope to see you on the mat again soon. The chat, Francisco. I always love chatting. Thank with you. you. Thanks for having me, Tristan. And yeah, let's let's uh, let's keep working and uh, hope to see you on the mat again soon. The chat, Francisco. I always love chatting. Thank with you. you. Thanks for having me, Tristan. And yeah, let's let's uh, let's keep working and uh, hope to see you on the mat. Do you have any stories of good UKs or bad UKs? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments if you're watching this on YouTube. You can also go to the Facebook group Aikido the Marshall side and post a comment there. Your input and engagement helps podcasts like these stay around. Please support it by liking, subscribing, and sharing. Enjoy your training!